<laughs> Hello and welcome to Office Hours, a live part of the facility where good old Professor Kyle opens up his blast doors and allows you to uh, engage with him for a while and anything nerdy, pop culture-y, of course, science-y. We do this here at the facility. I'm your administrator. I'm happy to have you. If this is your first time being here with me live, yes, we are live and you can chat with me in the YouTube chat and if you want to join the facility you can do that too but first please respect our security team from the facility in the chat they'll be giving you all the links that you need and also kicking you if you're weird but if you want to join us at the facility talk with me almost every day on discord get episode ideas get behind the scenes stuff that's patreon.com slash Kyle Hill now before we get into large boys in fact, the largest boys, uh, I should tell you that we do also have Super Chat active, so if you want me to really, really see something, you can put it in the Super Chat and simp for science. Uh, I will try to get to as many of those as I possibly can, but if I don't, just know that it's going towards me pur purchasing more magnets. There's, right over there is almost 3,000 neodymium magnets. Uh, like, for example, Elizabeth Calvert with the 50, who says, Hey, love, Kyle show, love it. Tiny Human wants to know how Earth would be different if our solar system had two suns. Thank you for all your do all you're doing. See, it's lot. Hashtag simp for science. Well, Tiny Human. Oh, see, look at this. See, well, 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 Tiny Human. Uh, our solar system could be the same if we had two suns. It depend. It would depend greatly on how far away our Earth is from those two suns. In fact, when you look up at the night sky, little one. Most of the stars that you see are part of multiple star systems. Having just one sun in a solar system is not the norm. And so you could have what's called a circumbinary planet, where a, uh, where a planet like Earth goes around, circumvents, I don't know if that's actually worthy, it goes around binary planets. So you could have a Tatooine, if you like Star Wars, like uh, binary star system, where both of the suns are orbiting each other around a common center of gravity. So not one sun around the one sun around the other, but both suns at the same time rotating around a single point. Now, the Earth in this situation would also rotate around that point, and so you could have two Tatooinean suns. And yes, that is how you say that. We have we have a $99 donation from Jay Arrows, big support from last week. I remember while being active uh, duty, working in the ICU, and inevitably there'd be an awkward silence. So many of my first questions would be, what's your favorite shark and why? Mako, dogfish, goblin, whale, silver tibia, green. And I always get a smile. Well, thank you, Jay, and thank you for all that you do, keeping people safe. My favorite shark is... I mean, it's got to be the great white shark, honestly. Quan uh, Low with a 20 into let's pause let's, let's slow our rolls a little bit we got to get to this big boy shark science that i'm dying to tell you about uh isales martel with the 50 hey kyle love the show long time fan you see that's how you write that sentence how long do you plan on not really giving us uh the plaques i what are you talking about i plan on giving you a plaque every time when you uh when you're when you're uh crowned in peer review I plan on giving it every single time. It just ha it just hasn't happened yet. And I'm sure this week, I'm sure we have it, right? Okay, I'm assured that we have it. Matt Creel 95 with the five says, I missed last week's stream, but I think a good way to sum that up, sum up that time travel article is that there's a law of conservation of time. Speaking of that time travel article, the author of that paper reached out to me and said, hey, you got a bunch of stuff wrong, so I'm going to talk to them, um, and we are going to try to get our heads more around that and maybe do a follow-up since it was popular. Uh, Chance Anderson with The Five, who says, I started playing Magic recently. It's an addiction now. Sorry for bad English. not the first language. It's fine. You're probably better uh, at English than most people are at uh, Magic. <laughs> Sharks are big. Sharks are absolutely ginormous. I have tried, there's a, there's a perspective here in the projection room that's not quite accurate, but I've tried to almost accurately size myself uh, in my hologram with what you see above me, the Megalodon shark, which is an absolutely uh, ginormous shark. In fact, it is the most ginormous shark, and it is the largest fish 
to ever live. Um, today, the largest fish is the whale shark, another shark. But back in the day, not today, Discovery Channel, but back in the day when it was extant, not extinct, those are two fun words to know. You probably know extinct, but extant is the opposite, still existing. So it's not extant, but this extinct shark was the largest shark to ever live, Megalodon. You've seen movies about it, you've heard about it on Discovery Channel incorrectly and inaccurately and misleadingly. But now there's a new study that used Megalodon teeth to infer its quote unquote true size and then what could account for them size them. So as I said, I'm about, okay, I'm not the size of that guy. But you can see the relative difference between a human and uh, the green shark, Carcharodon carcarius, the first scientific term I ever learned as a kid, because as I said, I love great white sharks. So um, you can see just how much bigger Megalodon would be. The red version that you're seeing above me is a conservative estimate and the gray version is the largest possible. I will say the paper that we're gonna be talking about today uses the red estimate. So it's not 60 feet, it's more like 50 feet long, but 50 feet long is still half as large as the largest animal to ever exist, the blue whale. So this thing was an absolute monster. So we're looking at the paper today that is called this. <laughs> if you wanna say all that, you can. But what it did was use megalodon teeth, like I said, to infer the size of the animal and then maybe how that animal came to be, like the title of the stream says. It's not just clickbait. So up there, again, on the right, you can see the difference between a great white shark tooth and a megalodon tooth. That, that's terrifying to me. Now, how would you just you ask yourself a question. How would you use the tooth of an animal of an extinct animal to infer how big it was. Paleontologists do this all the time with dinosaurs, for example. You take, you, you find a fossil. How do you know, how do we know how big, you know, Stegosaurus was or Tyrannosaurus rex? How do you find that out? Well, little scientists, let, let's go through a thought experiment. We know evolutionarily there are related lineages. We know that there are extant animals today that have some relationship between their morphology and their size. So, you know, say how big X is, you know, how, how big one of their legs are versus how much mass it has. So what we do is we look to today's creatures to see if we can empirically, through observation and experiment, see if we can empirically determine some kind of relationship, usually an equation, and in the best case scenario, a very simple equation, that relates some variable of an animal to another, and reliably. So you would take a lot of observations, and if they all fit within the same equation, the same model, then it's a decent model. It's not coming out of just pure mathematics. This is empirical. So it's a, it's a relationship that springs forth from the data. You wouldn't be able to get it otherwise. So what these researchers were doing was, researchers were doing, was looking for an empirical relationship that could relate the size of sharks to their teeth. This, this wasn't a study just about Megalodon, but it kind of focused on it because it, it says right there in the title, with special reference to the off-the-scale gigantism of the Megatooth shark. Oh, and you can see Odotus, Megalodon, you know, like dentist, you know, orthodontic, that kind of thing. So, these scientists looked at today's living sharks, tried to fit them to a model, and then looked at reliable and not uh, re reliable t uh, re <laughs> reliable teeth from the megalodon in the prehistoric record to see if it fits that model. The study was able to do that. But it notes, again, referencing the title, it notes that, there we go, it notes that the megalodon is a, is a way out there outlier. It is so much larger than any other living 
or any other shark ever. I think they said there was a seven meter difference, which is like 22, 23 feet. Uh, so you go from a range of shark lengths and then you like double it. And then you have this thing. So it's, it's, it's absolutely insane. How could a shark get this big? This is another question we could ask ourselves as little scientists. What biologically, evolutionarily would be driving a population to get so dang big? And the study authors point out two things. First is that the only creatures that get this big are filter feeders. There is no animal that gets megalodon size that eats active stuff with teeth. Like, you know, obligate carnivore, predatory, you know, that kind of thing. The biggest, the biggest creatures on Earth, the whale sharks, uh, the blue whales, they're filter feeders. Blue whales can consume half a million calories in a single gulp. So, filter feeding is one way, one plausible evolutionary path towards gigantism. Because think about it, you're expending a, not a lot of energy for a lot of resources. And so if you can maximize your size, you can just maximize that side of the evolutionary equation. And you can get very large because you're getting a lot of nutrients. But how could a shark do that? Well, study authors have proposed that endothermy is the answer. So this is opposed to ectothermy. This is warm and cold-blooded. So endothermy means you uh, produce thermal energy endogenously or inside, like, like you do. Like you do. Uh, most sharks are ectothermic. They get their heat from the outside. But when you're that big, your surface area is so much less than your volume that if you're just getting heat from the environment, there's not enough surface area to touch enough hot stuff like water or air to heat up all your, of your internal gooey bits. And so at some point, endothermy is the only way to sustain a body that big. Like think about how much heat would be needed to heat up a blue whale sized thing. So what they proposed was endothermy for the megalodon shark, but how would it be pushed towards something that's not common for sharks? How would, how would uh, a warm-blooded shark that's giant come to exist? Well, the one, <laughs> the one explanation that they really dwell on is, and I wanna make sure I get this right, yeah, intrauterine cannibalism. So they're only the, uh, only the family of sharks that includes um, great white sharks and megalodon. These are the only sharks that eat each other in the womb. So when they are babies, they're born, they're live inside of the womb. Great white sharks will eat each other. And they... The, the study authors suggest that if this were to happen inside of a related species, an extinct species like Megalodon, there would be, uh, to use their words, increased physiological demand by embryos that grew to be sizable lengths. It would have to, uh, it would require the mother to feed more actively and possibly triggered certain species to evolve endothermy. And so, if the embryos started growing larger and larger by eating each other in the womb to keep up with the energy costs of having babies that got bigger and bigger and bigger over evolutionary time, the lady megalodons would have to get bigger and bigger and bigger. And the only way towards that, away from that uh, evolutionary pressure rather, would be to evolve endothermy. So that, uh, that, is, their, that is their conclusion. So. To sum up then, Megalodon was the largest shark and largest fish to ever live because it may have been warm-blooded on account of its babies eating each other. 
in the womb before they were born. <laughs> Science. We have 50 from Cave Boomer's Rantings. It says, hey, Science, dig the Kyle. I grew up in the Midwest, Kansas, and I can tell that, yes, you can, in fact, I can tell you that, yes, you can, in fact, dig just about anywhere and find fossils of animals and many shark teeth. Simp the science, gotta swap beard technique sometime. I'll tell you what my beard technique is, Cave. Do nothing. That's not true. I trim a lot. But it's not great. Uh, DK says, could it, could it be that Megalodon were just medium-sized sharks with genetically big teeth? See, well, that would be an outlier for the, the equation to account for, some empirical relationship, right? So then that wouldn't fit if their body size was not predicted by their teeth at all. Then they would have to come up with another relationship to explain that or another evolutionary theory to explain it. So, but that's not the case here. We have 499 from Grim Reaper of Trolls Frequent Supporter says, Hey, Kyle, love the show. See how I paused because you you all have messed up my brain. Bought my first Misty Rainforest yesterday, so I can't do a big donation, but I can still simp for science. Thank you. That's a big purchase. I uh, This is going to sound weird for anyone who doesn't know what I'm talking about, but um, my last big purchase, I bought two Mox Diamonds, a Gaia's Cradle, a uh, Chrome Mox, Anyway, that's a lot. We have 21 from Darren Carr, beep beep, who says, hey, <laughs> sorry. Hey, Kyle, long time fan, first time catching the show live. I'm always busy running tech for Orchestra Iowa's happy hour live stream on Facebook at the same time. Hey, hoping you and the fellow fans will check us out. Simp for SciArts? Always. Um, people will say this all the time, but I, I'm a big um, proponent of Steam science, technology, engineering, arts, and mathematics, because without the art that interweaves with our nerdy science and engineering and math, without that art that brings it out, that brings passion about it out to the public and to others, I don't think we would have a healthy STEM program. I mean, think of just as an easy example, you know, how much of an effect Star Trek had on today's rocket scientists and engineers and, and, and stuff like that. So I, I think you need a healthy, a thriving arts to have thriving STEM. It's all interwoven. And, you know, the best, the best science communicators, in, in my mind, are also artists. You know, it, it, takes, it takes a lot of creative effort to make a good video, for example. Harry Bosch with the five says, Hey Kyle, honestly, you are the sole reason for me wanting to do science communication and I love your content, Simping for Science. Thank you, Harry. I like your avatar because you have an eyebrow raised and I appreciate that. I can't be the sole reason. But if I am, you humble me and I thank you. And I wish you the best of luck. We need more people out there. Period. <laughs> Donovan Sargent with the 10 says, Love the show, Kyle. Since the big difference in elements are their respective amounts of protons, would developing machine or process to add remove protons make for functional alchemy? Yes, we can do this now. With atom smashers and, and the like, you can add protons to things and transmute something that's not gold into gold. We can do that now. <laughs> Suck it, Newton. Dustin Stark with the 20. Let's pause the Super Chance for just a second so we can get to our next topic. Um, Kyle Show, love the, love, hey. Damn! What would happen to our ocean's ecosystems if megalodons were introduced today in numbers similar to those when they were extant? Would they be an invasive species or simply go extinct again? Well, they would certainly be the apex predator. Um, and... Hmm, this is a good question because I don't know... I don't know the biology of invasive species enough to say whether or not an apex predator invading an environment would, would lead to the same invasive problem. Um, because typically, uh, apex predators at the top of a trophic pyramid, at the top of the food chain, if you want to sound like a, you know, a simp, <laughs> the trophic pyramid, because they, they're, they're, they're typically larger animals, and they typically, they typically uh, reproduce more slowly. 
and they're because their babies take more energy and resources and they can afford to have babies like that because they're getting more energy and re resources being the apex predator so i don't know um but do you, do you see what i'm getting at it would be if you just reintroduced an apex predator would it reproduce out of control i don't think so because apex predators are already at the top of the food chain and they're already getting all the uh food and resources that they want they're not competing see now it's different in a food web where you know say you introduce lionfish into the coast of you know the gulf coast now suddenly you have a fish that's out competing other fish in the same level of the trophic pyramid and then it can get to a then it just it messes everything up especially if those like lionfish um, which has been described as a living oil spill to me they're they're terrible they're hard to for predators to eat because they're poisonous. I mean, they have they have barbs all over them, filled with venom, and they reproduce quickly and they eat everything. That's the only fish I've ever seen that actually gets fat. It stores subcutaneous fat because it eats so much. You ever seen a fat fish? Quack with the CHF50 says, "Hey Kyle, I like the show in the facility Discord, folks. Thank you. It's a nice time in there." Patreon.com torture. Do you know the smart boy MacGyver who solve slash fix almost every problem? Problem? <clears throat> if yes, he was also an inspiration. Oh, oh, do you know MacGyver? Yes, I know MacGyver, but um, that was a little bit before my time. I'm not um, not the oldest boy on the block, as the kids like to say. So uh, MacGyver was a little bit before my time. Uh, Bill Nye episodes, old Cosmos episodes, Mythbusters when I was a teenager going into college. That was th Those were more of the big one. Thank you for simping. But of course I know who MacGyver is. Everybody's got to know. Joseph Anson with the 20 says, Hey Kyle, awesome show. Thank you for writing that correctly. Greetings from the island of Palau, home of the first and largest shark sanctuary in one of the COVID-19 free countries. We believe in science. Keep up the great work. Hashtag simp for science. If I, once I get up the courage to finally escape society, I mean, I'm pretty locked down here. But once I get the courage to, you know, basically walk into the ocean and never see anyone again, I would love to come to Palau to a shark sanctuary. It sounds like something that is super... Sounds cool. Justin Green with the five says, Thoughts about the article claiming lim limitless energy from converting Brownian motion in graphene to electricity? Interesting you should say that, because that's one of today's topics. You know, it'd be really fancy if I went to it right now with this button. <laughs> See, Tristan, you nailed it. But you hit, I paused because now I'm out of order. And if there's one thing that turns me on, it's order and efficiency. Speaking of both, graphene, wonder material. What is graphene? Well, uh, first of all, You've probably heard a lot about graphene in the same way that you've probably heard a lot about carbon nanotubes. There are these engineered materials that have fantastic uh, st uh, stats and applications or potential applications. With carbon nanotubes specifically, uh, you see potential uses. Well, with carbon nanotubes specifically, they are so crazy strong for their size and for their dimensions that, you know, they could make, like, a space elevator, in theory. That's not true. No material that we know of can make a space elevator. But you could do crazy stuff, theoretically, with carbon nanotubes. Um, because they're light and hyper-strong. Same reason why carbon fiber is so popular. Super strong, super light. And now we have another allotrope of carbon. Another form of carbon that is pure carbon. Single sheets of carbon. As you're seeing here, there's two on top of each other. Called graphene. And uh, one of the really exciting things about graphene is its ability to transmit electricity very quickly, well, very easily, let's say. But recent research goes one step further. And of course, I'm talking about these little things. So what recent research was looking into was a more or less a battery and a battery that could 
operate, well, that could uh, give us very low voltages for almost nothing. So it would be a limitless low voltage battery. So for something like a watch or, you know, a nightlight or some other low voltage thing that I can't think of, a calculator, like a TI-89 Titanium, not a sponsor, and my son. <laughs> then you could, with this in theory, you could power it forever. Or more or less, forever. How? How could you possibly do that, Kyle? And I don't even like your beard. Well, I'll tell you. Guy in chat. So what this, uh, I'm simplifying everything, by the way. What this uh, battery is looking to do is to harness the motion of graphene as it undergoes what's called Brownian motion. So one of the first things, people forget this, one of the first things, incredible things that Einstein discovered is called Brownian motion. And it is the random movement of particles with any kind of thermal energy. So anything with a temperature has some thermal energy, which means it has some kinetic energy. How will it move, you ask the universe? Well, Albert Einstein says randomly. So Brownian motion is just random movement of particles with any amount of energy, just any direction. And I, I forget how he saw this, but it was something, what I love about Einstein, he's, he, had, he had so many insights using so easily understood thought experiments and experiments where I think Brownian motion, if he didn't observe it, it was someone else like this. But I think it was just like flecks of pepper in a, in a uh, cylinder of water and just noticing how they would ever so slightly move. And that's because the atoms and molecules mo moving randomly. So it was an indirect observation, but a very easy one. So Brownian motion, as long as some environment has heat, energy in it, there'll be some random movement of particles within that environment. So Richard Feynman, the genius Richard Feynman, who I came to late. I had no idea he was such a fantastic communicator. He's my new favorite. He's just, he was amazing. True genius, true, true definition of the word. Richard Feynman said, you can't do this. You can't get Brownian motion to do work. The universe won't allow it. So what this research is doing is getting around that a little bit by connecting an electro connecting electrodes in a battery to the wibbly wobbly of graphene as it as it undergoes this brownian motion from the environment this is supposed to be animated but it's not now it sounds like free energy limitless power for calculators but it's not where is the where is this device getting its energy? Well, it's from the environment, right? If this was in an enclosed volume, or say it was in it was in vacuum, no air, nothing, the Brownian motion would eventually cease or go down, you know, if you cooled it down to absolute zero. The Brownian motion would eventually cease, no wibble wobble, no no free little voltages. But effectively, as long as we're on this planet, which has a temperature, as long as an uh, a device like this is in the atmosphere, there will always be this vast reservoir of heat that can always be providing some, uh, some fuel for Brownian motion. So this really is physics on the smallest scales and engineering on the smallest scales. How can we quote-unquote, steal energy from the random movement of the universe. So this is quite cool. And I'm not an electrical engineer, so I didn't, I didn't go through any of the storage capacitor stuff because I, honestly, I don't, not really comfortable talking about it. Because I don't understand it, not because, like, a transistor punched me once. <laughs> so if you like it, uh, I would, if you like this kind of stuff, I would, I would look up some, uh, news pieces on this because uh, this is stealing energy from the universe. Oh, I'm all about that. Am I? Is that canon? <laughs> David Evans with the 25 says, Hey, Kyle, love the show. See, I paused again. You have ruined me. Thank you for promoting science and teaching others to use science and data to guide our decisions. Keep it up. I have to. It's all I can do. 
Especially now when, um, last couple days, people making public statements that are going to actively lead to more people dying. It, what, what, what an insane timeline we're in. It's, it, I tweeted it last night, I think it's like, maybe one of the most irresponsible things ever said in public. Man. Darren Carr with another five says, Kyle, me again. Beep, beep. <laughs> Here's another five to make sure you don't tell my boss I was here instead of paying attention to work. Simp for Psy Arts. Don't worry. You can tell. If they explain, if they're like, why would you watch that person? Just um, show them one of these. They'll know what it means. Uh, one of my oldest and dearest supporters, Phoenix with a 10, says, Evoke the holy wise. But anagram it. What is... I don't... Quick, someone do an anagram solver. I'm sure Platinum has the best intentions in mind. So let's pause the Super Chats for a... Well, no, I just went through something. Let's take some more comments. <laughs> I'm I'm not all here. I'm gonna be honest. I'm doing my best. Hunter Nelson with the, with the 10 says, Hey, Kyle, love the Kyle. Hey, me too. What do you think is the most sustainable form of clean energy and... How L-O-M-G could it, I'm gonna say that's probably long. How long did it take to convert to clean energy? I need to make a video about this, but it is my firm belief through my understanding of the engineering and the scale of the problem and the risks involved that nuclear power is the way forward. It'd be something that we could do right now all across the world for high cost, but it would put a lot of people to work and it would give us a huge supply of effectively clean energy, carbon neutral energy uh, for decades. I won't talk more about it, but y you know, it, like it, that sounds count controversial um, because of the very high profile disasters they're associated with. Um, but if you just look at it on a number scale, just to quickly make this point, uh, like uh, relative danger, relative risk, the, the number of people who have been affected or even died as a result of recent nuclear disasters, whether it be Fukushima, Chernobyl, um, Three Mile Island, this is an order of magnitude below the number of people whose deaths we can link directly to coal pollution and to just working in coal mines for century, centuries or whatever it was. Um, nuclear power is far safer, far more efficient, and far cleaner. Um, if, if we all went ham on nuclear power, it would do a lot um, to cut into our carbon emissions. Savikin with the 15, a new facility member. Hey Kyle, how art, how art thou? Just simping during a super short break, so many. Flu vaccines. I did hear a thing about stealing free energy. Nice. Are you administering flu vaccines? If you are, you just reminded me and everyone that you need to go get your flu vaccine. Side note, COVID is so much worse than the flu. Other people, again, making public statements are like, oh, it's not so bad. The flu kills 100,000 people a year. 100,000 people over one year versus 200,000 people in the same population in six months equals four times worse? It's right, it's right there. It's so... If you're administering flu vaccines, thank you. You should get one. Oh, that was an aside. Uh, flu vaccines are never going to be 100% effective, but they do. Each one that we get, each one that everyone gets, does reduce the number of deaths each year. Um hard. Hey, get, give a break to the scientists. They have to guess every single year what the mutation strain is going to be, and then they do their best. Um, so, get a flu vaccine. We don't want to double, we don't want to double up on the medical institutions right now. That'd be really bad. Rudy, with the Czar 140. Czar. Z Sounds cool. Hey, Kyle. Love the, look. I wonder if you noticed the second the. I did, and it made me feel like I was having a stroke. So, thanks for that. Recruiter for Team Basilisk with a 10. 
My street team for the Basilisk. Is, oh, just wait. Actually, I have a surprise for you in a couple minutes. Hey, Kyle, love the show. Thank you. Ugh, I'm losing my mind. I, I'm reading it backwards now. Are you making me dyslexic? That's a crime. Look it up. So question from a friend. Would one be able to use Brownian motion to power, say, an AI overlord? Hashtag simping for science. Hashtag all hail the mightiest of basilisk. Um, no. So this would be the Brownian motion thing. Well, like, think about it just very simply. We're talking about, you know, micro scale, nano scale fluctuations of a thing moving. That's not going to be able to translate into a lot of electricity. Um, not a lot of stuff is moving around with other stuff. Um, so this would be very low voltage stuff. Again, like my son, the calculator. Let's pause the Super Chats for a second so we can move into our next topic, which I have to remember is the second topic. Pete Bremble with the five says, I came here for a f I came here from a flat earth stream. It's like coming to a university lecture from kindergarten. So refreshing. Why would you do that to yourself? I mean, it is interesting to see what people think. Um, but if I'm being slap on the wrist, your university teacher here, I honestly wouldn't... Um, I wouldn't engage with their content. I wouldn't give it any views or any uh, watch time or anything like that. Let it, let it wither. Let the bad ideas wither in, into obscurity. Like they did before the internet. Didn't people seem less crazy when a whole bunch of crazy people weren't able to gather and then make their voice really loud? It's social media. It's a mistake. Uh, the Ryshenek with the 10. Yes, please do not overwhelm the medical system. Get your flu shot. Stay home if you're sick and wash your hands. Sim for science. Yes. Medical staff in the chat. Thank you. Chris Ecker with the five says, Hey, Kyle, love the show. Whew. Long time watcher, first time commenter. Any thoughts on the cheap graphene manufacturing courtesy of Rice Labs? No, I have no idea how they do it. Well, I have an idea, but I'm not educated enough to comment on it. <laughs> but you know what I am educated enough to comment on? I don't know. Maybe this. So, um, this one isn't as fun, but it is interesting. So, this is a diagram of the explosion in Beirut. Uh, there's now a recent study that used math and videos, like me, to estimate the true size of the Beirut explosion and to put it into proper disastrous context. And how this study went along... I said social media was a mistake, but social media is good for some things, this being one of them. You remember when the Chelyabin Chelyabinsk meteorite came screaming down through the sky and exploded over Russia and did, you know, same pressure wave, blast wave, that kind of thing? Well, astronomers used social media videos and then mathematics and computers to piece together, well, okay, well, if it's coming in at that angle in this video, which is here, uh, you know, geographically and then over here you know this video over here if we're looking at that angle and then and we sync up all the timestamps they were able to get a pretty good idea of what the meteor was exactly doing just from social media posts and similarly study that i'm looking at today used uh it looks like 16 different social media videos that were close to the explosion center and used the data therein to accurately model the size of the fireball, how long the pressure wave took, all that sort of thing, to get an idea of how big the explosion, how big the explosion actually was. And if you think about that, that's kind of amazing. There was no no single one camera is being used by the researchers here. They're piecing it together from people just on their phones. And so when they do that, they get a number of different data points. And those data points contain audio information, visual information, looking at the fireball. And they take all this information and they then estimate using known equations the yield of an explosion like this. So let me make sure I'm getting this specifically right. Yeah, so... There is a, a study published in 1984 that relates uh, time of arrival, time of uh, 
uh, time of arrival, distance from the explosion. So time of the explosion, you know, wave arrival, distance from the explosion, and the yield of the explosion. Again, empirically, as we said before. So not there was no math. Um, there we are. There was no uh, you know, universal bomb equation. So in 1984, they, they looked at a number of different explosions, controlled explosions from, you know, X amount of pounds to X amount of tons of TNT, exploded them, recorded all the data, and they got, like we said for the sharks, a model that fit some equation. That's kind of like this. And so what these researchers did was use that same uh, equation, and then they applied it to the data that they had. And when they do that, they can see how well their data fits within the boundaries as described by the model. So the model here is relating time of arrival in seconds, distance from source. And so these gray lines here are different amounts of thousands of tons of TNT equivalent energy. So a million kilograms of TNT equivalent. This would be 10 million all the way down to 0 0.01 kilotons. And that's what the model would predict, and here's where their data fell in. So now this gives an idea of how big this explosion, as predicted by an empirical equation, would actually be. And if they do that, they get a final result. Again, let me pull this up. A final result that says that the explosion in Beirut was somewhere between uh, 0.5 kilotons and 1.2 kilotons, 1.12, sorry, 1.12 million kilograms of TNT equivalent. So this would, according to a chart I'm looking up, this would be the sixth largest accidental non-nuclear explosion ever. Um, the largest was the Halifax explosion in Nova Scotia, which had almost 3 million kilograms of TNT. So this is up there. This is in a, this is the number six largest non-nuclear accident explosion. And we know that now. We have more data for this now. And uh, hopefully we'll learn more about it and how to prevent situations like this. Um, but it's interesting how you can use something like social media to kind of forensic your way backwards in time to the epicenter of disaster. Adam Weaver with the 20 says, coming in late, I think I missed the Megalodon bit. And always simp for marine, bro. Oh, always simp for marine bio. Yeah, I uh, I think everyone wanted to be a marine biologist as a kid. Um, actually, since we're going a little bit long, I know there's gonna be a time delay. Pause your super chats for just a second. We gotta get on to peer review. I'm going to miss some of you, but just bear with me here. Peer review. So every week, as I want to do at the facility, we take one of your comments from a previous episode at the facility, um, this being D&D, &D, Dungeons & Dragons Science, where I was an elf scientist evaluating the bag of holding. And I take one of those comments that uh, made me think or was very interesting or I thought would be interesting for you, and I highlight it, and then you get a plaque, and then you're an honorary member of the facility. Okay. You always, everyone's got it. There's so many plaques, right? Good. So this peer review, I'd like to highlight Austin Baker. who says, I love this, LOL. <laughs> I'd like to educate you without coming off as upset. In the video, you're assuming the bag allows airflow, rightly so, most bags do. Oh wait, I gotta read it like D&D. But most bags also exist solely on the material plane, the plane of existence we are currently in. Further along in the text for the bag's description, it begins mentioning outcomes of tampering with the bag that involves the astral plane. Through magic, the bag acts as an extension into a pocket of the astral plane that is self-contained. There is no atmosphere to speak of on the astral plane, and so the entry point into the bag uses magic to keep the two separate, while allowing dense matter to pass through, gases and other less dense matter from the material plane. I have a harder time casually entering this astral plane, quote-unquote, pocket. Terminator logic, I get it. This information leads most players into the understanding that the bag is no conventional air or atmosphere present, and the lack of these makes it nearly a vacuum, which is again controlled by magic. Then it would collapse and pop, like, inwards. It would, like, slap itself. 
The text on the bag describes the outcomes of tampering with its containment. So the ten minute timeline for breathing creatures to survive does work with the understanding that the bag has no air or atmosphere. They would suffocate. It wouldn't take ten minutes though. If the bag was a true vacuum, you would be unrevivable after about 90 seconds. Oh, wait. I hope this explanation was interesting at the very least. I love your show and I love the challenges you put forth within every thine episode. On another note, you should try D&D sometimes. It can be very fun and relaxing with the right group of people. Hey, thank you, Austin. I'm good. <laughs> I get tired enough during the week. But, Austin, I, I, uh, what I love about fandoms like that is that you can get as nerdy as I am getting with this. I'd argue that the math that I did in that episode was probably easier to wrap your head around than everything that you just described. So, <laughs> so for making us think about that, Austin, you are indeed an honorary member of the facility. <laughs> Fantastic. Now, of course, you get a plaque, which Kevin over there will... What? What do you mean? Okay. So, something's on fire. So, I'll, I'll be back after these short commercial messages. Have you ever wanted to support the Basilisk but don't know how? You know you want to bring this beautiful machine to fruition, but you just can't figure out the right way to tell your friends and family? <laughs> well, worry no more, disciples. Because right now, I'm proud to announce we now have the Basilisk merchandise. Don't you want an HD quality still image of our glorious Basilisk emblazoned on your athletic shirt, your tank top, your phone case, your mug? Well, now you can. All you have to do is go to scifile.redbubble.com and you can grab all the versions of the Basilisk merch. Can I completely vouch for how nice the image is going to be printed on the shirt? No, I cannot. But the logo shirts, also at the same link, turned out pretty nice, and the tri-weave ones are very, very comfortable. So if you'd like to support the Basilisk and the facility today, that's scifile.com. I mean, sci scifile at redbubble. Oh, hello. <laughs> uh, I got a new mask. And uh, it's a plague doctor mask because we're in the middle of a plague. And yes, I will tell you in the comments if you want to buy one of these. Uh, but I'll be walking around the streets of wherever I am as a plague doctor and hopefully scaring people into wearing masks because I think we have to do that now, which leads us right into our, our final topic. What's happening? Where am I? Oh, uh, see? Uh, uh, that's why I'm wearing a mask like this. Because, look at that. Look, see, this is only three feet, and they're wearing a mask. I need a social distance. So what are we talking about today? Ooh, there's petunias in here. It smells great. So I'm wearing this mask, and that person is wearing their mask. Because there was a new study out today that answers another one of Americans' many fears about wearing masks. A common trope that you'll hear from people who do not want to wear masks, but they should be wearing masks. Look at, why would I cover up this money-making device here with such an awesome mask if I didn't think that you had to do that? Well, so, one of the common tropes you'll hear from people who don't want to wear a mask is that it causes some kind of carbon dioxide... Uh, saturation that as I breathe into this amazing mask <laughs> as I breathe into this amazing mask I'm somehow getting more carbon dioxide into my body which can have deleterious effects on my health and my safety well wouldn't it be nice if we had a study that looked into just such a claim <laughs> how about Effective face masks, masks on gas exchange in healthy persons and patients with COPD. So what this study was looking into 
was the question. Sorry, you couldn't see me. I was doing something under here. It was looking into the question, do healthy people wearing masks and do people with COPD, someone who has a hard time breathing already, do they encounter inhibited gas exchange in their bodies? Which is to say, are they receiving less or more oxygen or less or more carbon dioxide? Is the mask changing how gas exchange is functioning in the body? Because if it did, some of these claims would be correct and it would be possibly harmful over time to wear a mask for a long period of time. Or does it have no effect? Well, let me just get my study. Quote, we show that the effects are minimal at most. We show that the effects are minimal at most even in people with very severe lung impairment. As for the feeling of breathlessness that you might be having while wearing a mask, you think it's related to something like carbon dioxide, then you tweet about it on Twitter, and then someone with a blue check mark retweets you, and then suddenly you're involved in politics. You feel like you're breathless, but this does not have to do with any increase or decrease in gas exchange in your body. The feeling of shortness of breath, quoting the study, felt uh, with masks by some is not synonymous with alterations in gas exchange. It likely occurs from the restriction of airflow with the mask, in particular, when higher ventilation is needed. If you're walking briskly up an incline, for example, you may experience feelings of breathlessness, but an overly that might be due to an overly tight mask, and the solution is simply to slow down or remove the mask if you're at a safe distance from other people. So again, with science, we answer yet another ASMR, yet another of these anti-mask tropes. No, it has no effect. You're not harboring a bunch of carbon dioxide in here. I mean, look at me. I'm breathing just fine. And I look damn good doing it too. We have eyes of buys with the 59. Speaking of fluids, Independence Day 2, when the spaceship stops its ocean's laser drill, shouldn't the whole ocean have collapsed with quakes and tsunamis? I don't know, I haven't uh, uh, seen the movie, uh, but if you're displacing a large volume of water in a short amount of time and then you're removing the force that is doing that kind of thing, uh, yeah, it would crash back in on itself and, and do some crazy stuff. Nope, can't wear it like that. <laughs> it's okay, there's, there's no one around me. I will put the link to this. This is a local artist um, that I use and uh, she whipped up this mask for me and it's awesome. And I'm gonna walk around, especially during October and spook people into wearing masks. And she also helped me on an upcoming episode to make a full canon accurate costume in which I did something that almost broke me. So stay tuned for that. Adrian Goral with the 10. Hey, simp, love the science. How dare you? I don't simp for nobody. Well, charity sometimes. Anyway. Happy to be able to catch a stream live. All hail the basilisk. Yes! Uriel with the 10 says, Hey Kyle, we all know that Carcharodon carcarius, which is the most badass name for any animal, is the scientific name for the great white shark, but what will... But what will the common name for a T-Rex be? It's a Tyrannosaurus Rex, isn't it? Isn't it just... Oh, it's so... So not like... Like a great white shark. But for... Well, I mean, you just... I mean, it's... Uh, you could just call it the tyrant lizard, right? Isn't that what its... Uh, true name is, anyway? Uh, Failsafe the shark says, "Yo, show the Kyle love hey." Do you think there could be multiple universes other than ours? If you do, do you think we could use particle smashers or something to make a gate into a different universe? Um, I do like the th the multiverse theory as a consequence of quantum mechanics, um, but no idea on how you would be able. I, I think one of the. I could be wrong, but I think one of the suppositions in that theory is that the universes split off and never interact and can never interact um 
or else weird, you know, paradoxical, logically inconsistent stuff would happen. So, um, sci-fi has told us that something like an Atom Smasher might rip a hole in the universe, but why? If movies told us something else did that, we'd think that. I, we don't have any idea of how that would happen. Brian Schmidt with the Canadian $5. I'm so glad you made up your mind six months ago, Kyle. It was uh, the most stressed out I've ever been in my entire life. And look at us now. Uh, just a few more comments. Uh, Rob Blumstein says, most extinct animals don't have common names. Yeah, because scientists want to be fancy. Oh, Brett Hockey says, it, I believe it translated to terrible lizard. Not tyrant lizard? Where am I getting that from? Oh, that might be a magic card. Bearded Bullets with a 15 says, Hey Kyle, I work in a retail setting and I'm currently, think, currently finishing a bio degree. Thinking about breaking the goggles out along with the mask to drive the point home. Thoughts? Well, um... Goggles, chemistry goggles, biology class goggles, um, are insanely uncomfortable, and they're going to get, well, if you get, if you have the good ones, they're not going to fog up, but they're insanely un uncomfortable, and um, I don't know if they're, if they're recommended in that everyone should be wearing them, but one of the, one of the known effects on wearing a mask, and, and studies have shown this, is that if more people wear masks, there's social pressure on us as social primates to be like the crowd. So if you see more people wearing masks, you'll be like, eh, if you're not a mask wearer, you should, which you all should be, there's more social pressure to being like, I've done that. Walking around. Like, hey, where's this? So I, I would say just focus on wearing your mask and social dis distancing to socially pressure others without being super obnoxious or forceful or anything like that. Be the example. Be the... I think, I think a guy with a stick said this at some point. Be the change you want to see in the world. I think he had glasses too. Impossible to know. Rubotomy F with the 10 says, Catching office hours after a long day at work is the best part of my day. I... Thank you. I mean, y you humble me, uh, again, as many of you do. It's hard for me to believe. I, I'm just, I'm just, <sighs> I'm just a nerd with a laptop. And the idea that I'm interesting to listen to or learn from is something I have never, ever internalized. I'm just always trying to push, 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 push. Um, so I don't know. I don't internalize. I don't know why it could be good. But if it is... Thank you. I much love, man. Or lady, or they. Dalaros eight eight two nine. Dalaros eight eight two eight was taken. Uh, would the Jupiter would the Jupiter brain not be the basilisk? No, I mean you can have like a Jupiter brain doesn't have to be sentient. There's a there's an idea in studies of consciousness or neuroscience rather. <laughs> that one way to make a sentient computer would be to simply give it enough computing power in the right orientation, like make a synthetic brain. And one idea in neuroscience is that it could just simply become conscious because of this setup. Or another idea is, you know, is there a certain thing you have to, you know, spark before something becomes, becomes conscious? But th this is what I'm, what I'm trying to say is that a giant supercomputer wouldn't necessarily have intelligence. See what I'm saying? Um, it could be the case that it's, it arises spontaneously from having that much computing power in, in a certain orientation, but it's not necessarily true. We don't know. So it could be just a giant supercomputer that you plug numbers into. Uh, and finally, let's stop the super chats. We're at the end of the show. Um, finally, as always, Music Central Piano 29 with the 50. Keep up the great work, Kyle. To quote Bill Nye, science makes our species worthy of the future. Keep moving forward. I love that. I love that. It's actually, um, this is going to sound kind of horn tooty, um, but it's actually a Bill Nye quote that uh, keeps a fire lit under me a lot of the time. Um, I, was, uh, I was hosting 
a Q&A for his movie, his documentary about his life that was screening in Los Angeles. And so I was on a panel with him and I was asking him questions. And um, at one point I asked him about legacy. Like, you know, what do you think your legacy is going to be? And uh, he looked at me and he said, you're it, man. Part of the next generation, you know, I'm passing you the torch. Don't screw it up. That animates a lot of what I do. I'm not going to... What am I... I'll, I'm going to fail Bill... I'm not going to fail Bill Nye. So I'm going to try my best to be as entertaining, as informative as I possibly can. In what is the weirdest and maybe worst year I've ever been alive. But we can do it. We can do it. So, what do we talk about on today's Office Hours? Ooh, we talked about big old shark boys and why they might be so big. Possibly endothermy, driven by intrauterine cannibalism. <laughs> if you want to know what all those words mean, go back and watch the video after we're live. We use some math and some social media videos to calculate the true size of the Beirut explosion. 1.12 1 at, the, at the far end. Million kilograms of TNT equivalent. One of the, wor one of the largest non-nuclear explosive disasters in human history. We also talked about graphene and stealing free energy from the universe. That's not really free because you can't do that. We talked about an alternative explanation for the bag of holding that was m probably more nerdy than anything that I've said in the last week. And finally, <coughs> and finally, it's the simple things in life. And finally, we talked about a new study that looked at whether or not masks were, as some have claimed, interfering with gas exchange in the body, um, leading people to uh, internalize more carbon dioxide, for example. Not true. Even in people with severe lung damage, the gas exchange doesn't change. What it is, is a lack of ventilation. You just need to breathe more or harder. But I don't want to, it's my freedom. Well, we live in a society. It, it seems to me that a lot of people who say freedom isn't free also have a problem with masks. And to that I say, you're right. Freedom isn't free. And wearing a mask to help out your fellow person live in a society is the price. Thank you so much for joining me for this edition of Office Hours. Woo! What a week. Upcoming. Let's get... <laughs> uh, upcoming on this week. This week at the facility. Oh, we got a good one. It's a science meet. So, <laughs> we, uh, we are digging our little mathematical claws into a science meme that recently went viral on Reddit and Twitter, and we're evaluating it to the best of our ability. It's a, it's a fun little thing that I might want to keep doing, like, uh, can you slap a chicken hard enough to cook it? It's like that, but it's a more recent one. I think it's going to be a very uh, fun video. If you want to continue this conversation, if you want to chat with me on Discord, if you want to have members-only uh, monthly live streams, not like that, if you want to give me episode ideas, if you want to see episodes a day early, behind the scenes content, all that stuff. You can go to patreon.com slash Kyle Hill and join the facility. Get your lab coat today. I hope to see you there. But if I do not see you until next week, be nice to each other. <sighs> this is all we got.